Amen. Let's join in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, draw near to us once more. May your light shine upon us, your grace be within us, your love be made known through us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the season of Advent, you've already heard the gospel lesson from Luke chapter 3, which talks about John the Baptist and his place in history. Well, Luke, as a gospel writer, also included a genealogy, a description of Jesus' family tree. Catherine's already spoken about that. And so for our scripture lesson, we're going to look at those verses, which can be found in Luke chapter 3, verses 23 to 38. Now, there literally are 77 names, and I'm not going to read them all for you. That's simply... Um, not the most exciting liturgy. But I do want you to note what's there. So we're going to look at some of these names and this genealogy. So it begins in verse 23 by saying, Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his work. He was the son, as was thought, of Joseph, son of Heli, son of Mathat, son of Levi. And on it goes. In the next slide, you'll see that the genealogy continues down to the time of the 12 tribes, and I've put in bold there the name of Judah. So Jesus, through Joseph, would trace his lineage through the tribe of Judah. And remember the little verse in Micah that says, How Bethlehem, you of the least of the tribes of Judah, from you shall come forth a Savior. So from Judah, we get to the lineage of King David. And in the next slide, we actually see David listed there. King David with his father Jesse and Obed and Boaz. And Boaz, you might remember, is the man who then took Ruth under his wings and became a family, and from them the lineage of Christ continued. And that moves down through Abraham, the patriarch of the entire people of Israel with his wife Sarah. The last slide then continues the genealogy through the years before Abraham, down to the very beginning, you'll see the last notations there in bold, son of Seth, son of Adam, son of God. So Luke wants to show and trace Jesus' lineage all the way back to the very beginning, even to Adam and God, as Catherine said, that our human story would very much be combined with Christ. Friends, may God's word bless us and guide us in all that we do. Amen. So I have an older brother. His name is Richard Carter Bush, and we'll let you see a baby shot of he and I. Rick is four years older than me. He has grown up, and he lives with his wife, Kim, in Kansas City. He lives near to his daughter and his stepchildren and his grandkids. Now, from his expression in these pictures, I'm not exactly sure what he thought when a little brother appeared on the scene, usurping from him all the attention that he received happily as an only child up until that point. So Rick and I are part of our family, but I'll acknowledge that I also have a younger sister, Amy. And Amy is part of the three children in the Bush family, and I think she's probably glad that this morning my focus is only going to be on older siblings. So again, my older brother Rick is a great guy. Rick is one of those rare guys and dads who will sign up to host every holiday gathering in his kids' classrooms at school. He's a guy who loves toys and gadgets and fireworks. He's someone who can fix almost anything and talk to literally anybody. Now, because Rick and I are four years apart in age, we were never at the same school at the same time. But he paved the way for me nonetheless. I would follow Rick around, wishing that I had a cool mini bike like he did. I watched as he took apart and souped up his green Dodge Charger. I saw as he got his first job, working at a gas station, and then when he went off to college, and when he married and moved away. 
Many things have changed in my life over the years. I too went to college and got married and have kids. I have pastored churches in Africa, Wisconsin, and now Pittsburgh. But one thing hasn't changed. I'm still the younger brother to my older brother, Rick. Now many of you have older siblings yourself, or perhaps you are an older brother or sister to someone in your family. And even if you're an only child, there's likely someone who looks up to you as a type of older sibling, a mentor, someone for whom you fulfilled the role of elder. When you think about our family stories, we are all branches tied into one family tree. And all of our stories include those who have prepared the way for us, who've gone before, whether it's elder siblings or parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. And if we're honest on those family trees, there's a few branches that cause us to chuckle or frown. There's the doting aunt and the somewhat unusual uncle. There's the oddball cousins that come along. But ultimately, it all comes together to tell a story of who we are. And I want us to recognize that each of us, you in particular, are an important part of your family's story. And I hope you never forget that. During the season of Advent, almost every year, we take some time to talk about John the Baptist. Because in many ways, John was an older sibling, an elder relative to Jesus. Because Jesus didn't just appear out of the blue. Jesus was born into a family, a particular place in time in history. And that locale was directly connected to John the Baptist and his story. When Pastor Patrice read the opening from Luke chapter 3, you heard this veritable who's who list of those in power back then. We heard of Emperor Tiberius and Governor Pilate. We heard of King Herod, ruler of Galilee, and how his brother Philip is ruler of Trachonitis and Aitoria. We heard of the Jerusalem high priests, Annas and Caiaphas. The list starts big with the Roman emperor, and then eventually it moves its way down to the humble family of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is related to Mary. When both of these women surprisingly turn out to be pregnant, at one point they met, and the family stories that they each shared became more closely intertwined. Soon, Elizabeth would give birth to a son that they would name John, who would grow up to be a prophet, preaching in the wilderness and baptizing beside the River Jordan. And Mary, too, as you know, would give birth to a son, a son who would know of John's ministry, who would be baptized by him in the River Jordan, who would also be called a prophet, as well as the child of the Most High God. So two young men, two prophets crying out for justice, two martyrs who were arrested and put to death by those in power whose name we heard read earlier. And yet, the works of John the Baptist and of Jesus have far outlasted those of Tiberius, Pilate, and Herod. Now, you can get to know me without knowing much at all about my older brother, Rick, or perhaps about my father, Frank Richard, or my grandparents. But much of my story is tied up with my family. And in the same way, you can learn about Jesus Christ without knowing much at all about John the Baptist or how the family tree supports both John and Jesus. But if you don't know that history, you miss out on some important details because we all take part in a larger story during our lives. Our actions shape that story for good and for ill, and the effects of our actions ripple down through the ages for generations to come. Martin Luther King Jr. had a great analogy to capture this idea. In his book, Where Do We Go From Here?, King described that there was a famous novelist who died, and amongst his papers they found a list that itemized different plots he might consider exploring. And one idea on the list was this. 
a widely separated family inherits a house in which they have to live together. And King thought, well, this is actually a perfect analogy for humanity. He said, we've all inherited a global house in which we have to live together. Black and white, Easterner and Westerner, Gentile and Jew, Protestant and Catholic, Christian, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist. A family long separated by ideas, culture, language, and religion, yet now forced to live together on one planet, in one house, as part of one story. See, the English word family may have the letter I in the middle of it, but no family can ever be defined only by the I at the center, not in our literal families or in our global families. That's not simply a pious moral statement. It's a pragmatic reality. Wherever the coronavirus originated, however it came to the United States, it is something that all of us in this global house have to now contend with. Wherever there are stockpiles of weapons, whether military, nuclear, chemical, technological, all of us live lives at risk. And when we talk about climate change and how our environment is being destroyed around us even though our life depends upon it, we often talk about the science of ecology. And yet the word itself Ecology comes from the Greek word oikos, which means house. And so the very study of science, of preserving life, acknowledges that all life lives in the same house, the same home. Now, not only do we live together now, but the reality is our lives through time and history have always been impacted by those who've gone before us. Now this includes close relatives like my family members. I, I learned a positive work ethic by watching my brother Rick. But this same type of influence happens from people that only pass through our life incidentally, but they touch us at pivotal moments. Pope Francis recently wrote an essay that was published in the New York Times that talked about how we need to come together during this COVID pandemic. We need to move from self-absorption to embracing bonds of compassion and peace and solidarity with one another. And to illustrate this idea, he told a story from his own life. When Francis was young, in his 20s, he had a serious lung infection and because of it, he was hospitalized, had part of one lung removed, and actually spent time on a ventilator. But Francis credits his recovery from this illness to the work of one nurse, a Dominican sister, who was working and tending to him in the ward when a doctor came by. And that doctor evaluated Francis and gave his orders. But as soon as the doctor left, this wise angel of mercy told the other nurses to double the doses of antibiotics that the old doctor had just prescribed. Because from her experience, she could see clearly that Francis was dying unless drastic action and strong intervention occurred. As Francis put it, that nurse understood better than the doctor what he needed, and she had the courage to act on her knowledge for the sake of a young priest a priest who would eventually become the Pope. Now, Pope Francis chose to tell his own story by including this special Dominican sister nurse who saved his life. Martin Luther King chooses to tell the story of racial justice by reminding us that we all live together in one global house. The Apostle Luke, in writing the Gospel, chose to tell the story of God's love for this world by then grounding the story of Jesus in this long genealogy that connects Jesus back to not only Joseph, but to David and Abraham, all the way back to Adam and Eve of old. Because Luke the evangelist understood that to understand Jesus and his story, you have to be prepared by learning 
others' stories. And so we, before we ever heard the voice of Jesus in the gospel, we hear John the Baptist crying out in the wilderness. Before Jesus could say, blessed are the poor, John cried out by the river Jordan to make the crooked straight and to bear fruits worthy of repentance, justice, compassion for all. Jesus needed an older sibling. Not that John was meant to be the Messiah, not that his light was supposed to shine as brightly as Christ, but by John's actions, by his witness and his words and his baptism waters, he prepared the way for the one that was to come. And so this is the big question. For whom are you preparing the way? For whom are you a beloved, necessary, critically important older sibling? There's a reason the Bible contains stories about people like John the Baptist. And there are those long genealogies that list the ancestors who've preceded us. See, we often think about eternity as everlasting time going forward from us into the distant future. But eternity also includes time going backwards. The genealogy of Jesus, inasmuch as we too are followers of Jesus, is now part of our genealogy. Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, David, Joseph, the father of Jesus, their stories are now part of our story. And we are a continuation of that same history as it extends forward into the future. Their legacy continues in us. And we are responsible to our ancestors, to those elder siblings, brothers and sisters, who prepared our way. The Christian ethicist Bruce Birch put it this way, The past is not only not dead, it is not yet finished. The faith community is charged to carry forward the hopes of the ancestors and the dreams of their God and to realize their hopes and dreams by God's grace as best as they can. Friends, you are part of the Christmas story, part of the family tree of faith, part of the genealogy that goes through Jesus back to Adam. And you are also an elder sibling like John the Baptist, you are a preparer of the way for someone that will follow you. You've already been added to the long list of history past and included in the history yet to come. So all that remains is for you to go now and prepare the way of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.